Bingo. We're back here on a given Wednesday. This is the Brad Coates Show, otherwise known as Community Matters with Brad Coates. Hi, Brad. Hi, Jay. Good to be back. Yeah. And today we're going to talk about the Delta factor. When I say Delta, I mean la différence. La différence. Viva la différence. Not necessarily between the sexes, is all, that, all that's always relevant, is between the generations. Yeah? Okay. Changing habits in relationship and romance, the generations, they are never the same. What do you think about that? Well, it's interesting because, you know, when I wrote the Divorce with Decency book, and I've rewritten that crazy book five different times for the UH Press, and each time I try and keep track of what's coming up with the next generation. This was not a big deal when I first started in 1999. We didn't have a lot of this information. But there is definitely a, a huge difference now between the, between the baby boomers and between the millennials that came behind them, there was a Generation X that was kind of a lost, smaller generation between. But the big ones are the, genera are the baby boomers, millennials, and then Gen Z, which is actually going to be bigger than even, even the millennials. How can you tell? I mean, I, I got this vision, you know, these people are in the privacy of their bedroom. Okay, there's a knock on the door, and it's Brad Coates with, <laughs> with a clipboard. I just have a few questions I'd like to ask you. How do you find out about this stuff? Well, there's a lot of stuff being written on it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a social, I'm a divorce lawyer. I'm not a social scientist, especially, although I've kind of become one by, you know, just by osmosis. But, but there's all kinds of stuff that has been done on research of this. Uh, the Atlantic Magazine did, did a huge article on how the millennials were having far less sex. Turns out everybody's having less sex than, than we boomers did. This is not good for the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the, the curve, the uh, demographic curve. Well, if you, don't have, if you don't have as much sex, you don't have as many babies, and, you know, we're below the refill rate for a population in, uh, in, the, in the U.S. to begin with. Yeah. I mean, you have to have something like 2.1 children uh, to, to keep yeah. the population stable, and we're down to 1.75 per yeah. couple. So, yeah. so that's, a, that's a problem. And it also is a, is a bit of an issue because, the, you know, there, there's a little bit of resentment between the generations. The new tagline that I was hearing the other day was, OK, boomer. Or they just started, you know, they just, the, the Generation Z guys just kind of gaff off anything the boomers have to say. Because, you know, the boomers did, uh, I mean, we like to think that we changed the world for better, but a lot of people think we changed the world for worse. I mean, we took a lot of the money, we took a lot of the jobs, we're, you know, a lot of us are still in jobs that they think they ought to have by now. Um, there's a little bit of resentment, and there's definitely some, uh, some other changes that are going on. Boomers, for divorce, which is what I track, boomers are getting divorced. At twice the rate of previous generations. I mean, the, the statistics on boomer divorces are staggering. Uh, and you would think that a, a marriage that had been stable for, you know, 20 years, 25 years, you people in their 60s, you know, okay, that ought to be the height of stability for a marriage. And, the, and in the old days, that's, of course, what it was. But not anymore. The Terribly room. inefficient, really. Yeah. And yeah. diseconomic, I might add. Well, that's true, too. Yeah, that's there's, true a, there's too. a movie called uh, The Marriage Story. If you haven't seen it, you got to see no, it. It's, it's a popular, Netflix yeah. production. It won awards. It's quite amazing. Uh, and um, uh, you're going to love this movie because it goes into this very sort of thing. No, it's interesting. Uh, right now, one in four Americans getting divorced is, is, is a baby boomer. It used to be like one in 10 in, uh, in you know, 19, 1990. Divorce rate for boomers has surged like you know, 50% in the last 20 years. It's amazing. I mean, really, the, the boomers who have always kind of wanted to have their own way about everything. I mean, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, and we're going to change everything from the 60s on, from clothing styles to, you know, to... Uh, the key, the key for, for sex was, of course, the birth control pill. None of this would have ever happened as a sexual explosion, but for the birth control in, I think, 1963, 64, women, for the first time, were able to enjoy recreational sex. And that was a big breakthrough. It used to be a pretty big choice for a woman as to whether she wanted to have sex at all. I remember I, I practiced for a while in the, in the 70s in, in matrimonial issues, and uh, uh, my plate was always full. They came around, well, they wanted to get divorced so fast, it was, yeah. it was head spinning. And I thought maybe it cooled off after that, you know, maybe things came to a kind of balance. But now it sounds like it's right up the ramp again. Well, actually, it's, it's sort of plateaued for every other generation except for the boomers. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, we, the boomers did kick it off in the, in the early days when they were, you know, the, the young boomers. Then it sort of stabilized in the 80s and 90s and the 2000s. And then the boomers are, again, as they get older, are divorcing again. And, you know, as I've talked on your shows before, the, 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 the more people are accustomed to getting divorced, 
where they do get divorced. I mean, the, the actual divorce rates are about 40% for first marriages, about 60% for second marriages. It goes up to 80% for so third you, marriages. Right. So, so you get the habit of getting divorced. The more married, the less likely it's going to work. That's right. Can you explain that? Well, I, I think uh, people just get, uh, they've got the divorce lawyer's number programmed into, the, <laughs> into their speed dial. You know, I mean, they're just, they're just, they're, they're used to doing it. They've, you know, they've survived it a time or two. They're not as, not as frightening. And, and the, the thing of it is, is there's an expanded, expanded pool of potential choices. I mean, that's a, the internet has brought, has brought that about. And that's, that has a lot to do with it. Now, it used to be that, you know, you're 65 years old. I mean, you get divorced, you know, what the hell are you going to do from, from this? But, you know, now you're 65, you go on to a website and you can pick people that are age 58 or 59 or exactly, you know, where you want it. You've got to be able to afford the, uh, the argument, so to speak. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, in this movie, uh, it studies that. There are some lawyers who are reasonable and, and do reasonable things. There are other lawyers that see this as a, uh, a target. And there are some clients who wind up yeah. <laughs> bankrupt after, after the argument's over. You've got to be really careful about divorce lawyers because, you know, the reality of it is they get paid by the hour. And the longer they can protract a fight, the better, uh, the more they make. So yeah, you've got to yeah, yeah, be yeah. careful. Yeah. So, I mean, th that's a factor that works just the other way. In other words, the boomers have enough money to live independently. They have enough physical strength and their health, thank goodness for medicine, uh, to, to continue to live a reasonable life even without a spouse. Bottom line, footnote to that is that, you know, I think the stats are clear that if you're living with someone, married to someone, your, use, your useful life is not the right word. Your, you know, your, your, your expectancy. life expectancy sure. is greater because you're in a, a kind of partnership that one takes care of the other. There's no um, question what, what marriage or a, or a committed relationship uh, d does increase the likelihood that you'll have a, have a longer and healthier life and that you'll amass more money. And you, and you don't necessarily have to get married. A lot of these boomers are not getting remarried after this. They've got a new status right. called CU, committed unmarried, where because the wife doesn't want to lose her alimony by getting remarried, for a second, you know, she loses the marriage, alimony from the first marriage. Uh, maybe there's government benefits, whatever, pensions. You know, not, they don't necessarily want to intermingle all that. So they just live together without getting remarried. Which you know, is, which is uh, you know, become increasingly common in all generations, but the boomers are surprising. Looking at it as a, a policy matter for the whole country, you know, if everybody was in a CU, did you call it? Yeah. Um, and there was less marriage, little, little marriage, um, that wouldn't be necessarily good for the, for the country because you need to have a resilient, no. uh, even if it's uh, based sure. on a religious sure. connection, you need to have a resilient relationship for there to be stability, right? And, and the less marriage you have, the less stability. This is especially so with kids, when you have kids. And, well, I, and I worry for the country uh, if we give up the institution. America's economy thrives on what the economists speak calls household formation. Getting married, buying a car, having kids, you know, you know putting, not putting, do those putting, things so putting well, them through you school, know? you know, and, 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 and all of that is, of course, you know, what keeps the economy going. But a lot of these cash strap Generation Y, uh, they, you know, they can't do it. The, the, the millennials just got whacked uh, financially. They, you know, they had, they had something like a 63% drop in, 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 in net, in net uh, worth, and, you know, from uh, 2000, uh, I, think, I, I think it was 1998 to, to 2009. I mean, people just got hammered in that Great Recession. And the millennials got hit the worst, and they, they didn't see the humor in it. It's interesting. There's other stuff about the millennials that is surprising. Millennials are having less sex than either the boomers or apparently Gen Z. The, 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 the millennials have um, kind of a, 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 a weird uh, approach, to, approach to sex. They're having less sex, less relationships, less commitment. The sex they are having is more casual. It's more of this hookup kind of stuff that you see on Tinder and the, and the dating sites. Yeah. Um, but they're less likely to have a, um, a report having a, a regular sexual partner. Something like 75% versus 85% that, you know, millennials have a, have a regular sexual partner. So and a lot of them aren't having any sex at all. I mean, a lot of them are staying virgins longer. If you don't have sex in your 20s or your teens, your formative years, they say that you're less likely to have it, you know, ever in life or, or until you're 45. I mean, you know, that is the time when you're finding yourself in, you know, the teenage, early 20s years, you're finding yourself on all kinds of levels. Including, including sex. That can't be good for you. And it can't be good for the demography either. Well, no. And there's, uh, there's other aspects of this that are just totally bizarre that I would never have, have figured out you know, or expected. Apparently, the millennials 
are somewhat in inhibited when it comes to physicality, period. You know, we all grew up taking showers in gyms and, you know, and, you know after, after school. Apparently, it starts with gym classes. There's fewer gym classes, and, and you don't have to shower after gym class, so they're, used to, they're not used to being naked in front of other people, so they're freaked out about, 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 about just really the physical intimacy it's of a see, privacy seeing issue. the naked body. It's a silo issue. Yeah. I live in my little protected world, and I never expose myself. This is so interesting. It's fascinating. It really is. They, they, they call it inhibition. The millennials don't like to get naked. They require their privacy. They something like uh, 60 percent less millennials are sixty six percent less likely than older generations to enjoy receiving oral sex. So go figure. I mean, you know, I don't want to make this an X rated show, but oftentimes oral sex is the best sex for for actually enjoying sex, especially for females. That you know, the, the oral sex is one of the things that gives them orgasm. One of the most likely to give them orgasm. So but they're know, freaked out about it. They, they, oral, they don't. They don't want oral sex, which is you know news to me because I, I kind of always enjoyed it. But you know, it, <laughs> but it is uh, it's it's very surprising. So you know, the Liberation Day of the '60s and '70s, I suppose. Right. Not the '50s. No, that was too 50s early. Were, 60s, 60s mostly, where things got liberated. That's over. Yeah. That's over. Yeah. You know, I mean, I remember I lived in New York at the time in school, and uh, boy, it was it was liberation time. Well, it certainly was. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, everything from Carnaby Street and dress changes and rock music and the birth control pills, sex, drugs, rock and roll. I mean, it all, it all happened. Vietnam War, there was, you know, the Broomers got very passionate about a lot of stuff. And like I say, the... The other generations kind of resent the fact that we took all the money, uh, we've got all the jobs, we've got all the, you know, status in society, and because we're aging, you know, people used to, I mean, you know, my dad's, I think, retired at 62 or something like that. I gave him a golden watch and he walked out the door, and, you know, now we're all working, you know, you're still having talk shows at 70-something, so, you know, some young Generation Z person probably chomping at the bit to replace you. Um, well, it's about use. Or replace it's, me as a divorce lawyer. It's about the perception of use, you know. Um, and I think that, that has a lot to do with all of this. Well, they, I, feel, they feel like they've been stymied. I mean, this, uh, this OK Boomer thing, you know, millions of kids in the succeeding generation, they, they use that as that OK Boomer as kind of a put down. Yeah, OK Boomer, leave me alone. You know, they're fed up with the feeling that they've been left a world plagued by climate change, mounting debt, unaffordable housing, income yeah, inequality, yeah, all the kind yeah, of stuff yeah, that, you know. true, it, isn't it, it? It is true. It is true. I, I've been surprised and somewhat disappointed in our generation, which grew up thinking, oh, we're going to have communal everything and we're going to save the planet. You know, I mean, we've, you know, done, we consume more than any other generation ever, where, you know, we're, a lot of us are spoiled brats and, and, uh, and haven't done our share. They haven't done anything near what we thought we were going to do when they put out the whole Earth catalog and everybody was going to wear, you know, uh, uh, you know, working stock sandals, and you know, we were all going to tread lightly on the planet. That we have not done that. That was yet. that was uh, in the '60s, but it kind of went away yeah. as we got older. And I, you know, this is a really great conversation. Not necessarily about the matrimonial aspects of it, but it's about um, the conversation between the, the boomers and the millennials. It's like the, the boomers say to the millennials, well, it's yours now. It's up to you to take care of me. Yeah. And the millennial says back to the boomer, what do you mean? You give me, a, you, know, you give me a mess. Okay, how come you didn't give me a better deal? This is your fault. And the two of them, that's, that's, that's your fault. That's exactly right. <laughs> and, and the millennials now are getting whacked with another problem, which is that one out of four millennials is having to take care of an older parent or a relative. So well, now they're having to take care, you know, now they're irritated by the fact that they're having to care for us. Maybe Social Security disappears, maybe Medicare disappears, God only knows. And, you know, we've taken all the money and spent it, and we're having them, we're, you know, we're moving back into their houses to be taken care of when we get incapacitated. Well, so, Elizabeth Warren says it's time for a revolution on this well, kind of stuff. We had a care. show two weeks ago with uh, Helsinki. You know, which is in some ways the heartland of the Scandinavian model. Right, right. And they really care about their neighbor. They care about their community. Uh, they care about people getting older. They're going to take care of them. They're going to give them free health care, all that stuff. Right. And, and what's remarkable is that they are light years ahead of this country. And this country had no political will to catch up. Yeah, yeah. No, the Scandinavian countries are a, a true model in an interesting community. But they're a small community. You know, That's true. That Not means. that many people. A smaller number of people, and they're in there, uh, except for Sweden, which has taken in a lot of, uh, lot of uh, Muslim refugees, and maybe on the verge of regretting it. Um, they, uh, you know, a lot of them are really, really sort of, you know, 
all one one common crux and creed and, and identity. So well, that leads them to a very important point. We're in the middle of uh, maybe change, uh, transformational change, if you will, uh, in so many things. I mean, uh, Europe is a good example of transformational change, but I think it, it's been held up in the U.S. We haven't really got there, but I think we're going to get there. We're going to have to get there. And this process you talk about, um, it's, it's going to have to adapt to these transformational changes, uh, political and otherwise. Yeah. Well, what was interesting, I went to your Christmas party for Think Tech, and Robert Pennybacker, who does a lot of PBS stuff and does a lot of training for, for young filmmakers and stuff, he was saying that he really thought the Z generation, which is the one that comes after the millennials, they are total digital natives. They're the first generation that's really just been totally digital. And they are actually adopting some more, I wouldn't say conservative values, but they, you know, they want to own houses, they want to own cars, they're going back to wanting to be married. I mean, you know, they kind of, millennials kind of, you know, they were, you know, they had to. I mean, they got hammered by the economy. They, you know, they, they couldn't live at home with their parents. They couldn't do a household formation they wanted to. They're living in their parents' basement, for Christ's sake. Yeah, yeah. But, the, but the Z generation apparently, and Pennybacker spoke eloquently, I thought about that, about how the fact that he thinks the Z generation could be the one that's going to come along and try and, you know, try and save us, so to speak. I mean, the millennials kind of resented it. The Z generation are taking it as, as the situation that they, they face. And then, you know, because they're so computer savvy, they, they take in information faster and they, and they absorb it faster and they're, they're kind of dealing with it faster. How, do you, how, how are they on sex? How are they on... Um... Apparently better than the millennials. Um, but the problem, of course, is when you take in all that information so fast, your, your attention span starts to diminish. And there's another problem where... That happens to me, too. <laughs> you know, I've got a theory that the, the, the social media and, and the computer generations to some degree are, are rewiring the, the human brain to where we're more accustomed, you know, turn offs matter than turn ons. You know, some, some you know, rock, some uh, actor or something comes out with a political position and, you know, a hundred people come in and talk about how Im, Im, improper that was. But, you know, I mean, people are really just getting hardwired to go negative instead of positive. And that is, that's tricky. And it's certainly tricky when you talk about these generational things and, and romance, because you've got a situation where a lot of people have, are, are getting, uh, you know, instead of getting excited and positive stuff, they, they have immediate negative stuff. It means that they, the, the turnover oh, is so fast in these. In these That's stuff. absolutely true. Yeah. yeah. And, it's, and, it's, and it's kind of an interesting deal. There's a, there's a quote for the, 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 um, the, for the uh, um, millennials that I think is a great one. We hook up because we have no social skills. We have no social skills because we hook up. And when you think about that, that's exactly right. You're having these, these brief fleeting encounters. A lot of it's done through the media. There's something called ghosting nowadays, where instead of having a decent breakup with your, with your significant other, you just stop talking to them all together. You don't, yeah, I mean, it's, it's turned people into kind of weird sort of antisocial social animals. And it's, and it's kind of a... It's, it's, a big, it's a big change. I mean, they're, they're, like I say, they're inhibited. They're not, they're not happy. They've got the, 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 uh, the all-time highs for, uh, for um, depression. The millennials are, are uh, in danger of having, uh, being one of the first generations to not outlive their parents. I mean, there, there, are, there are some serious and, and issues. they're less affluent than their yeah. parents. Yeah. Well, and then they're less healthy. I mean, their, their mental health is, is not good. They're, there's a lot of depression. Uh, they're... they're the sexual, uh, the, the, the sexual uh, STD rate is going through the roof. It's the highest it's been in decades, which is weird because you think they're having less sex. How can they be having more sexual transmitted disease? Because of the way they're doing it. Right. It's, all these, the one, it's all these hookups, one night stands instead of having regular partners. And not, not aware of STDs and all the rules about yeah. that. And yeah. this. You know, uh, so the question is, can you break the mold? Um, I suppose you can always slide back, you know. You can be uh, a Generation Z that acts like a millennial, <laughs> which is not so good. But you can be a millennial that says, gee, you know, um, I should move out of the house. Um, I should get a job. I should look for a long-term relationship. Um, I should care about those sort of middle-class values and, and do the right thing instead of the hookup thing. Uh, not, not a temporary life on the planet, but a long-term life on the planet. Um, What's, what's your thought about that? What's your advice about that? Can they change? Well, the possibility, like I say, there's apparently a trend that, that, that the Generation Z is adopting some more of the... I'm talking the about the millennials values. themselves. The, millenni yeah. the millennials are going to have a, a harder go of it, I think. Um, you know, the, the, 
The problem is, it's almost the, like the paradox of choice. When it comes to relationships, it's almost the paradox of choice. You, too much choice, too many options, almost leads to the inability to pick any one because there's always something new around the corner. I mean, you know, you're swiping. I've never been on Tinder, but, you know, I mean, you, 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 I know how it works. You know, you're swiping left, swiping left, you're swiping, you know, you, 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 know, you go through, you know, 100 possible choices. How do you, you know, how do you pick one? Whereas when you and I were growing up, you know, you had to meet somebody live and in person. I mean, you know, maybe this was going to be the best person you were ever going to meet. And, you know, maybe you thought, oh, my God, if I don't marry her, then I'm, you know, then I'm never going to see any. So there's, there's almost like, you know, there's the, the limited number of selections trying to make you make a selection. Whereas and now with this infinite number of selections, you know, God only knows where it all stops. Well, does it work? You know, the, the dating sites, the match sites, does that work? Do you have any stats on that? Do you have any feeling about that? In other words, if I'm looking for a spouse um, or a long-term relationship, and I go on one of those sites, I was always troubled by this, actually, Brad. I go on one of those sites, and, you know, my column, the, the menu, right? My menu looks just like her menu. So I say, oh, this must be the right match. It's a computer match. Yeah. That's what it is. You know, is that likely to work, or is there something beyond the computer match that make for a better relationship? Well. Um... All I can say is that, you know, whereas I used to have clients that would come into my, my uh, office at the end of their relationship, and they had, you know, been high school boyfriends and girlfriends, met in college, done, you know, whatever. Now, when I ask them, how did you guys meet? You know, more than 50% of them met on Match.com or one of the dating sites. Interesting. So, I mean, it definitely, it has turned over a new leaf as far as the way people date. There are no longer, you know... I don't know how much time you spend as a barfly, Jay, but, you know, and, not, and I, much. I, not as much as I used to either. But, you know, you used to go to, you know, big events and you would meet people, and, you know, here in Hawaii, there were block parties. There were, you know, what, you know, big popular bar those days. restaurant row would open up. Your and firm be, always had a Christmas yeah. in August program, which everybody was interested well, in. Well, my that. firm's Valentine's Day party is still one of the last ones left standing. But, you know, you used to meet people in that kind of real configuration. Now that doesn't exist. It's small little groups of people getting together. Oftentimes, texting each other the last minute, saying, "Okay, let's you know, let's just sort of get together and, and hang out." Women, the guys aren't inviting girls to come, you know, have a date with me. They're having it. They're 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 saying, "Hey, me and the guys are going to be at Joe's bar, you know, eight o'clock. Why don't you and some of the girls come on down?" You're not even sure who's really who's really with who. And uh, she, that's so true, Brad. That is so true, and that is a remarkable and noteworthy change between what, 60s, 70s, 80s, and now. Uh, you know, it used to be that you would have a substantial crowd get, getting together. Right. And like, you could, like our party last week. And you could, actually people, talk to you each could other. meet people in person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah. you know, that's really not happening anymore. So it leaves the social media and the dating sites to be sort of the way. And, and what's happening is, I've talked on this year about your show before, so I won't belabor it, but it's also causing a self-selection between the, the stratas of society. Because now, you know, you can find somebody who's, uh, they've got these millionaire websites now. You have to be a certified millionaire to go on and date other millionaires. And, they, and so now the millionaires can marry each other. And the doctors can marry do other doctors. And then, you know, it used to be a doctor would maybe marry an attractive nurse or whatever, you know, and I don't want to sound like a chauvinist pig, but, you know, a, a partner in a law firm would maybe marry a legal secretary. <laughs> yeah. you know, that doesn't happen anymore. Now doc doctors and lawyers marry each other, which means that they preserve the wealth. That's the other part of the income inequality. But let me give you a, an interesting aspect of how the hashtag Me Too part of this is all carried over. A recent poll, in a recent poll, 17% of Americans aged 18 to 29 now believe that a man inviting a woman out for a drink always or usually constitutes sexual harassment. Sexual so, harassment? Sexual harassment to ask somebody out for a drink. So it used to be that was the sign of an alpha male. You'd go to one of these big parties that we were talking about, you know, good-looking guy, he's taller and darker and handsome than the other guys and better for breeding and, you know, whatever, you know, and, you know, I drove a big car, whatever, you know. Um, you know, he was, he was a guy who would be an attractive to, to the opposite sex. Now, you know, if you exhibit those alpha male deals, you know, hey, look at my Armani suit and, you know, you're meeting a girl in an elevator, you know, and don't I look sharp and can we go out for a drink? Now you're now it's sexual harassment. So it's almost like... There's not even a premium to be placed on that. In fact, it's a, it's a negative nowadays to uh, to act like a, a, an, oh, an yeah. aggressive an aggressive male. <clears throat> That's a nice a dress contact. you're wearing. Yeah, can't say that. Yeah, I can't say that. Yeah, and you really have to be careful what you're saying. 
And really, you know, a lot of these things are totally harmless. They're <laughs> perfectly okay. Well, they used to be, but that they was before. Be. That was before the you know millennials invented the and, and the Z's doing the same thing. Safe spaces, and you can't say this, you can't say that, you can't have somebody come to a college campus and lecture at a viewpoint that's different from mine. I mean, we've really, like I say, the, the the negatives and the haters have begun to outweigh the positives, and that's really silos. Thing. Yeah, silos. This is, is this, and so and, and social media, you know, actually enters into this and totally. and supports it, right? Because you can have these really what they call it thin mechanical relationships on social media. But you never really know the person. And I think, you know, like the match site, um, you can wind up in a, in a long-term relationship or a marriage based on an incomplete examination of the other person. This is really a problem. And it's, it could be a problem individually, but it's a bigger problem when you're talking about 350 million Americans uh, who are more and more doing that very thing. And I worry about the Z guys. I worry about the Z guys following through on what you described, because they may not actually wind up doing that, given the changes in our political environment, the likely changes in our economic and social environment. You know, what you see and aspire to now for them may not be the same environment in five or 10 years. They may wind up yeah. in some other category somehow, yeah? Good point. Yeah, Good yeah, point. yeah. Well, it's, just, it's safer to do it that way. I mean, the, the, the anonymity that goes with the internet, you know, you can do all kinds of stuff. You know, you can, you know, everything from, you know, planning out a mass shooting to, you know, you can do all this kind of crazy stuff in your own little zone without ever having to perform as tested against any reality. And, yeah. and dating is the same way. You can kind of like, you know, okay, I'll just worry about these tiny little things, but I'll never figure out the, the real guts of human interaction. And that's, uh, that's, to my view, but again, we're sounding like crotchety old guys, so, you know. We are, but you know what? I mean, uh, uh, age actually yields some wisdom, and so that's my last question to you here today. What's your advice to the Zs? Uh, what, what would you tell them to try to, you know, learn from what your experience has been, our generation's experience has been? What should they know, what should they do in order to in order to um, you know, have the best generation possible. You know? Well, maybe it's a melding of, of what the boomers and the millennials, have, you know, I mean, get a little, take the best of both generations. I think, you know, I mean, the boomers get hammered for having, you know, taken all the goodies in society, the wealth and, you know, the, and, and the, the planet itself. I mean, you know, we've you know, you know, abused it. Um, but they also brought in the sexual revolution, the, 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 the feminist revolution, the, you, know, we did, you know, we did a lot of good stuff too uh, that made life a lot easier for, for you know, a lot of the technological uh, stuff was really brought about by, by boomers. Um, and and uh, it's now being certainly expanded upon by the succeeding generations, but a lot of these, these things that have been positive in society were, were, were the, and the boomers at least had an experiential kind of a, you know, we're going to go out there and kind of grapple with stuff. I mean, you know, you can, you can trace it in all kinds of different areas. I mean, you know, when I was young, the, 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 the first thing you did was get a car and hit the open road when you're, when you're 16. You get a passport and you go ride the Eurail around Europe. I mean, you know, it was, it was like we're going to, the number of, you know, of Americans that are traveling abroad that even have passports, that even have cars, that even do anything outside their little safe space is, is, is diminishing. And that's, you know, and so maybe, Maybe you take some of the best of what the boomers had, and then you take some of the some of the understandable irritation that the millennials had, and blend it into a Z generation that goes ahead and merges both. That would be the best hope for case. Travel, travel. You got to get travel. out there. Travel is definitely American broadening. kids don't get out there enough. Yeah, they got to go east. They got to go west. They got to take the risk of travel and learn and suck it all up. Yeah. Well, and when you hear something, when you hear you know college campuses, you know you know kids booing somebody off stage if they don't have the same viewpoint they do. I mean, isn't the whole point of college and a liberal education to hear competing viewpoints and synthesize them? It's just you know it's like I say, some of this has gotten a, it's way too easy to find your own little insular little grouping and and stay there as though that was reality. And technology reinforces yeah, that. Yeah. Technology can give us great lives, but can also complicate our lives to the point where. It may not be worth it sometimes. Thank you, Brad Coates. Hey, great for you to Thank come you. down. We're going to do I this love again. Talking to you. Don't forget. Yeah, we're going to do always, this again. Always love talking to you. 2020 is coming soon. <laughs> Aloha. And aloha, all the Think Tech audience. This is a great program you put together here.